at this point I will hand over to a past president, the past president of the society and welcome you very much, very, uh, very dearly, if that's the right word, to um, give the annual lecture. Thank you. Yola's out there, I think. It will turn the lights off. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's get my tech. Thank you everyone for coming tonight um, and joining me in this journey through some of the monastic history of Europe, or rather the post-monastic history. Um, I have many general um, votes of thanks to give to all the scholars who've supported uh, my work over the years in um, Tudor and later architecture and especially a group of European colleagues with whom I travelled annually um, all over Europe looking at buildings and who have inspired me to think my way through um, this uh, question this evening. And one of them, um, my British colleague on many of these tours, Professor Deborah Howard, is here tonight. I also have very specific thanks to um, Anka Neusserbar and Thomas Lang of the city of Halle, who have been very helpful to me in bibliography and of all sorts of information about the buildings about which I will speak. Um, this talk is about the disposal of the buildings and properties of monastic houses in Reformation Europe. It will look at the extent to which the dissolution in England and Wales is atypical, both in its enforcement and its impact on 16th century building more generally. I'm going to start with this image, which is serendipitous in a way because at the moment um, Holbein's Lady with a Squirrel and a Starling is on loan to our city museum in Brighton and it falls to me to give one of a series of lectures on that later this week um, but also I had to help with pulling together relevant images around the picture and of course Brighton like many city museums now are very strapped for cash they couldn't have loans and in the stores is this Cranach workshop portrait on the right um, of Frederick the Wise. So he's on show in the room with the lady with the squirrel. And it's just too fortuitous and too tempting not to start with this comparison. Two pictures with inscriptions. Holbein's um, portrait of Prince Edward of about 1538 or 9 and the uh, Cranach, the posthumous portrait, one of many, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of portraits that the workshop produced of um, Frederick the Wise um, at that period. And, of course, the inscription under the um, Holbein of Prince Edward is very much in the Tudor dynastic manner. Little one, emulate your father and be heir of his virtue. The world contains nothing greater Heaven and earth could scarcely produce a son whose glory would surpass that of such a father. Only equal the deeds of your parent, and men can ask no more. Should you surpass him, you, you, you will have outstripped all the kings of the world, and none will surpass you. A highly dynastic Tudor um, message there. Underneath um, Frederick the Wise, it says, and this follows the portraits made in his lifetime, I am justly called Frederick, for I maintained a blessed peace in my land. 
and with great wisdom, patience and luck, despite the plotting of a number of scoundrels, I graced my lands with new buildings and founded a new university in Wittenberg in Saxony, which became famous throughout the world, and from it the word of God came forth and wrought great change in many places. Now, it would be unfair not to mention at this point, of course, that Henry VIII was a founder of places of education. The refoundation of university colleges at both Cambridge and Oxford, and of course a school, um, Westminster, that we um, saw in our study trip um, in September. And I just put up a detail of the Norden map. Of course, it's, it's here just south of the um, uh, cloister area. Um, so certainly religious um, uh, institutions turned into new foundations for education. There has been much discussion though more generally as to whether the dissolution in England and Wales had any kind of forward programme other than the realisation of funds for the state which of course was then poured into the coastal forts and later the wars of the 1540s, and the emphatic riddance to any political adherence to Rome following the uh, Act of Supremacy, which declared Henry VIII as head of the church. The Acts of 1536 and 1539, followed by swift closure of the monasteries as establishments, uh, and then a complex use of the buildings, a complex story of their use over a long period of time, then happened. Once the lead had been stripped from the roofs and valuables taken, the chief source of income, of course, to the Crown was land and land sales, not the relatively low return from the sale of buildings. And it has always interested me that one of the ways, however, that the government did perceive some kind of need for controlling this process was what happens and is stated in the preamble to the 1536 Act, because owners of these lands are obliged, and I quote, to keep or cause to be kept an honest continual house and household in the same site or precinct, and to occupy yearly as much of the said domain in ploughing and tillage of husbandry. So there was some awareness that the... Um, that the continuity was necessary between past and present. And that's certainly one of the themes that will emerge in the things I'm going to say tonight. What happens, of course, happens in stages. That first phase of very rapid transformations of sites, largely by leading courtiers who got in quickly and changed these monastic sites into country houses or realise their value if they were in urban environments. And particularly in the disposal of the urban properties, um, some of which, um, by virtue of local pleading, as in the case of the Greyfriars Reading, where the town council wrote to the king pleading for part of the Greyfriars uh, to form a new town hall, some of these monasteries in urban environments were turned into warehouses, tenements, town halls. And here we are at the Charter House in London, still wonderfully a survival and wonderfully covered um, by, um, by the Survey of London, which became part courtier residence, part lodgings for royal courtiers. The uh, family of Bassano court musicians were lodged there for many years. And of course, most significantly from the early 1540s till about 1545 or 6, it housed the office of royal tents before a more permanent office was set up uh, for that department of state um, at Blackfriars. After this early phase, there was then a second phase of something of a rethink. Um, and I, at one stage, did some work on the monastery of Sopwell in Hertfordshire, where the second generation of owners in, a, in essence restored the former cloister, rebuilt the, the, the former cloister, realising that cloisters were a usual means of passage around the internal courtyards of houses. 
And then, of course, the story goes on into the later 16th and the 17th century, where 40, 50 or more years after the suppression of the 1530s um, and some temporary use of the buildings, great families turned these buildings into permanent dwellings. And I show you Buckland transformed for the Greville family there on the left and Ford Abbey on the right. We'd only reached its resolution as a workable country house in the 17th century. There was always the sense that solutions are ultimately practical, um, often using the most recent or most sound part of the building um, in order to um, uh, uh, realise the best part of the fabric. So why do anything um, to that wonderful 15th century uh, cloister at Laycock um, when it's a perfectly sound structure, on top of which and around which you can build your new house, as Sir William Sharrington did? Many of these buildings have been closely investigated in, in recent times. The Charter House is one of many superb monographs we now have on these structures. They show how these buildings profoundly influence aspects of planning, of circulation, of, improv of the improvisation of materials. Um, they're, they're not generally, uh, this process does not generally happen by any new aspects of startling architectural style or innovation when it comes to appearance. It's very much in the formation of houses, town halls, public buildings that their influence happened. Occasionally there may have been an architectural statement and recently at the launch of Pevsner Hampshire um, South, the revised Pam uh, Pevsner volume, discussions with Bruce Bailey about whether Sir Thomas Rithsley, the new owner of Bewley, um, put that new vaulted space into the great gatehouse as part of his new house there, very much as a public statement using the masons who had recently been working on vaulting at Winchester Cathedral. One of the things that has always been, I think, in our minds is that there's as much an argument for the continuous use and purpose of these buildings as there is for the very obvious destruction which takes place. And Thomas Risley here is a case in point because he'd been the lay steward of this monastery before the dissolution. He certainly had lodged there in the hospitium, in the guest apartments, several times. And so there was, to the people working there, some continuity of use, both before and after the Reformation took place. And then, of course, there's, interestingly, the royal use of uh, buildings. Um, and most notably, um, the reuse of materials uh, to, to build an such palace. Henry VIII uh, used um, uh, um, denuded monastic stone. Um, and then, of course, in taking over the houses of St. Augustine's Canterbury and Dartford Priory, prime places to make staging posts on the progress into London starting with the coming of Anne of Cleves in the winter of 1539-40. to 40. Interesting, both these sites, because um, the roofs were still in place in each case, and it's not so much um, using the pre-existing buildings which went on here, but the building of temporary lodgings in wood. Here we are at St Augustine's Canterbury, and it's this lodging here, which was rapidly put up in two months. Brick base brick and stone base, wooden lodgings above um, in two months by James Needham, the king's carpenter, for the reception of Anne of Cleves for just two nights um, in that winter. And here we have the Priory of, of, of Dartford, um, equally still roofed at the time the king was using it. Many of these monastic sites owned by Henry VIII were sold on. Uh, they were part of a a wider expediency around the manipulation of church property during this period, the moving of bishops out of palaces in London and elsewhere, uh, Noel and Otford in particular, in order to make other royal sites or to sell on their lands. When we turn to Europe by comparison, we find there are very different times of dissolution, different patterns of enforcement. There's it seems to me very much a divide between the suddenness and brutality of the English 
template where in some cases rulers are secure dynastic and act occasionally very brutally towards the monastic legacy and other rulers who implement uh, a reform following the coming of Lutheranism to their dominions but do it by discretion and over a much longer period of time. In the Northern Netherlands, the suppression of the monasteries largely happened during the period of the Dutch Revolt of the 1560s, so some decades after the first arrival of Lutheranism, Lutheranism in modern-day Holland. And it was really a matter of expediency, which meant that William of Orange moved his centre of power to Delft from The Hague in about 1572. And um, he moved there to Delft because it was a place very well defended by a ring of canals, it had high walls. And he moved into the formerly wealthy convent of St Agatha, a Franciscan house, um, at this time. From here he directed the ongoing struggle for independence from the Spanish, and here, of course, famously, he was assassinated in 1584, buried, to be buried in the new church um, by, in a tomb ordered um, from Hendrik de Kaiser in 1616. And I haven't put an image up because surely that tomb of William the Silent is the most represented, the most painted and engraved funeral monument in, in um, European history. And at the Prinzenhof, he finds a, um, a, a, a brick structure which he utilises. He lives largely in the spaces left by the um, nuns of St Agatha's. And what's interesting here, that continuity, is that it is the liturgical, as it were, um, uh, ranges around which he um, has his apartments. And it's here in one corner that he forms his study in what was the hospitium or guest ranges of the house. So a continuity of, uh, of use and a continuity of how a building is used according to the pre-existing spaces, very much in evidence here. Other examples of the decisive, the destructive, which is associated with the adaption of radical Protestantism, um, have a more characteristic form, which equals to some extent that of uh, Henry VIII's intentions in England. And it happens at those times when certain countries get their freedom from occupation, when there's a surge towards uh, nationalism, and also, as with our own example, the need to reward uh, the courtiers who either have put you there or are serving the new nation state. It's interesting across Europe because there are different pressures on both the need to reform and to realise the potential of these sites, but also to um, uh, take account of the fact that Catholics too in this world are on the move. So in um, Western Europe, and I just show you the famous print of the iconoclasm in the Netherlands of 1566, um, Catholic refugees from the southern Netherlands in particular um, uh, needed places of worship. Um, and in some cases, Catholic houses were preserved for them, especially if they brought worthy occupations of trade and manufactures with them. And it, at the east of Europe, of course, the threat from the Turks, the Battle of Mohac in 1526, meant that in the Kingdom of Hungary, many uh, nobles fled their monastic estates, and therefore, sorry, they fled their own estates, and therefore had to be recompensed by land from the monasteries. So there was quite a, a radical and ruthless um, uh, evacuation of the monasteries in that part of Europe. In Scotland, it's quite interesting that here there is, as it, going one stage further than the lay stewards of the monastery, which happened in England, a much deeper lay control of the monastic establishment before the coming of Reformation. Because in the first half of the 16th century, there came about the practice of the appointment of 
um, commendators or lay protectors of monasteries. Six of James V of Scotland's illegitimate sons got these posts. In some cases, people ruthlessly exploited this position and took money and revenues away, and sometimes um, buildings too. In other cases, they acted very responsibly. Two-thirds of Scottish houses um, had commendators at the time of suppression in 1560 to 61, just one year after the reappearance of John Knox um, back in Scotland. And it's in Fife, and I just show you two examples from Fife here, of course, which we very much associate with this ruthless um, uh, suppression of the monasteries in Scotland because of John Knox's um, journey of uh, 1560, where he moved through Fife and then went on to Edinburgh and Stirling, um, leading the suppression. Um, on the right there, Kouros, where the remaining choir of the abbey became the parish church and the cloister was demolished, and on the left, Inchcombe, where the buildings are remarkably legibly, legible still when you go there today, despite their total abandon in 1564. This was um, a um, coal mining area. People had other interests in this, this area. Um, from 1564 until they were assumed into guardianship in 1924. Inchcombe had also probably suffered considerably um, as a site, the abbey had suffered, because of course it was occupied by Protector Somerset in 1547 and by the French in 1548. In Denmark, an interesting scenario, uh, suppressions after 1536 when Christian II becomes king, but it's the first of our examples where, though the monasteries were suppressed, inmates were often allowed to stay in place until the last of them died. And this happens in quite a few of the examples which I'm going to focus on um, today. A more ruthless suppression in the electorate of Brandenburg, where Joachim II, who was ruler from 1535 to 71, in his, during his reign, 30 monasteries passed into the hands of nobility, and they're all building castles out of them or alongside them, um, or robbing them of stone by about 1550. One particularly interesting case is Sweden. Uh, in, it's in 1523 that Gustavus Vasa receives independence um, for the Swedish state and from the Kingdom of Denmark. And it's from 1527 onwards that monasteries begin to be suppressed. But there was never in Sweden any specific legislation about suppression. Lay administration was put in, desertion was encouraged, and it was only in the very early years of the 17th century that Charles IX um, finally closed Vadstena, the last surviving uh, monastic site. So religious orders being allowed to stay on in their properties for a considerable amount of, of time. Here we are at Sklokosta, where we go now to see the great 17th century house with its amazing interior of that period and its shell of an architectural workshop on the top floor, built between 1654 and 76 for the Wrangell family. But when you turn away from that building, of course, you also come across the remains of the Cistercian Abbey of Scoe, uh, whose land this originally was. And even though the family of Wrangell were in possession of this monastery um, by the early 17th century, throughout the earlier 16th century, some nuns remained and ran a school um, in, uh, uh, in the surviving parts of the, um, of the nunnery around this church. Two further abbesses were even appointed in the 1530s and the 1550s. The school was run for daughters of the nobility, and the last allowance was paid for them to do this in 1588. Between the castle, the 17th century castle, and that church, there is this interesting building quite recently um, uh, investigated, and it's now we now know that it was on this site in this part of the building was the brick kiln for making the church which stands behind us. Now that church, which I showed you just now, much restored, 
And later, this building became a house for the priests who came from Uppsala um, to administer at the church. And then in 1572, there's a letter from King Johann III of Sweden saying that the house is now ready in its final um, um, uh, articulation for his own lodging when he comes to the site. So the reuse of a former monastic um, building uh, at the far end of the cloister uh, goes on post the um, end of the and the coming of Protestantism to this part of Europe. In the German states, of course, we see the greatest amount of variation and change. And this, of course, comes about because of the huge impact of the Peasants' War of 1525-6, the Bauernkrieg. And what Germany exhibits more than anywhere else is the fact that, that when I talked about that business of there being a continuity across the actual point when the Reformation comes or Lutheranism comes, is that it is the major place where both before the 1520s and long after, monasteries survive but with ever fewer inmates. Uh, and this goes on across the German-speaking lands. One of the things one notes about England and Wales, of course, is that when suppression comes in 1536 and 1539, it's really indiscriminate as to order or the length of time since foundation. All the, all the houses get dissolved um, in two foul swoops, the under £200 income and over in the later Act of Parliament. In Germany, there are very different attitudes amongst rulers, amongst town councils, amongst the populace generally, towards um, the monastic orders. So there's often a critical and sometimes even vindictive attitude towards the mendicant orders, because they come more recently, they were felt to be more um, handsomely endowed, they carried certain privileges. Um, up to the point where there were assaults, for example, on the Franciscans at Hurtigenbosch in 1525, whereas the established orders, the Dominicans, the, um, sorry, the um, Cistercians, um, the, the Benedictines, were uh, much more tolerated within these places, even though, of course, it's amongst the um, uh, mendicant orders, Franciscans in particular, that Protestant, Protestantism found its greatest um, strength and support. Once suppression came, the monks fled or quickly left. So the Austin Friars in Wittenberg, 30 monks in 1521, six by 1522, and soon only three. But that included Luther himself, who had started all this. And what's very interesting is that whereas the male establishments, um, the monks took the money and ran, the female establishments tended to resist. And even when suppressed, were often allowed to stay until the last female occupant had died. Now, of course, the social historians have speculated profoundly about this, suggesting things about the class structure, that because more female um, uh, inhabitants of, of the orders were uh, from an upper class. These were women who had less of a chance of going back into the community and finding employment or finding the right marriage given their age. Um, those fewer opportunities may have meant that women um, resisted more than the, their male counterparts did, but also because, um, as happened um, at um, Sklokosta and the um, Abbey of Sko, which I talked about just now, they tended to be much more active in the running and foundation of schools and hospitals and really had more investment and therefore more persuasive opportunities to keep themselves in place. At the Cistercian uh, convent of Harvesterhude on the outskirts of Hamburg, the nuns moved out of the property but insisted they retained ownership of the site and that it became a house for poor women and a Lutheran women's college. At the poor Clares of St. Catherine's in Nuremberg, under its abbess 
Charitas Pirchheimer, she's the sister of Dürer's correspondent, Willibald. Um, there was tremendous resistance to any Protestant preachers going in, and Charitas Pirchheimer died on site at the Poor Clares in Nuremberg as late as 1596. There were many proactive cities um, and rulers who um, put money into the endowments of schools in the wake of monasteries. And of course, what also could happen was that what we find, which obviously is just unknown in the English and Welsh environment, that within these great Lutheran towns and cities in Germany, there may have been, or was, a bastion of, of Catholicism, a church that survived. And in one case, which I'll come back to in a moment, the, um, the, um, uh, the survival of a, really an enclave, a whole area of town, which belonged to a wealthy Catholic patron. I'm going to take you on a journey here through Thuringia and um, uh, Saxon Anhalt, uh, covering the towns through here and up. This area is to the north uh, west of this, so we're on a journey here through um, uh, Erfurt, uh, Wittenberg, uh, Schmalkalden, um, and um, uh, one or two other sites. Some of this, I feel, is very much to do with the way in which, particularly in Germany and particularly at Luther's behest, with his interesting insight into the role of imagery in the new Protestant world, it is images which help to formulate and make sense of the new Protestant message. Though in many cases, um, the, we find in England and Wales that we say now, thanks to the great scholarship of people like Tara Hamling and Richard Williams, that there was obviously a continuity of Catholic imagery in Protestant England. But the focus here was very much more on the domestic sphere of finding those sorts of examples from biblical story that could inspire and lead people in their daily lives. What we don't have in England really is the ongoing resurgence rethinking of the imagery of, um, of religion and of Christianity that Luther is very much responsible for inculcating. And this happens um, in a very interesting and subtle way. But first, just on that domestic sphere, and in a moment you'll see why I put up that very glamorous picture on the, on the web to um, um, advertise this lecture. If we turn to the great um, castle of Willemsburg at Schmalkalden, the Landgraf uh, William IV built here a new um, great um, schloss from 1585. It was designed by the court sculptor and architect Wilhelm Vernuken, and of course it has one of those amazing and wonderfully um, interesting Protestant chapels which has um, a communion table surmounted by the pulpit, surmounted by the organ, and we're standing here in the Landgraf's private pew looking down on the chapel of that ter of that. Um, uh, of, that, of that schloss. This chapel was consecrated in 1590. And it, in turning to uh, Netherlandish artists, Caspar van der Bocht, uh, Georg Cornet, and Joost van Hoff, uh, William uh, commissioned this great festzaal on the upper floor uh, with its great ceiling, um, with inset panels. Uh, relating to certain kinds of, and a certain variety of story making and allegory. Wilhelm was Lutheran, and there he is shown over the doorway as you go out of this room, next to this splendid fireplace with his coat of arms. Lutheran, but um, succeeded by his son, the Landgraf Mauritz, who was Calvinist. And so what we find at this place is a very interesting, and this is really some of the latest work that's been done 
on the conservation of the ceiling paintings is that some of the religious um, stories are obliterated to put in more secular um, themes, including this figure of charity, in the early 17th century under Mauritz, who has a new programme um, of iconography to impose on his father's palace. Luther takes to sermonising about imagery in 1522, and he returns to Wittenberg after the year of imprisonment in the Wartburg, um, and he finds um, iconoclasm going on. People are indiscriminately smashing images. His argument for keeping religious imagery in place, he expresses like this. He, he talks about the way that idolatry must be removed from your inner being, your yourself, your heart, um, and then, if things remain visual, they can be understood and instructive. And I quote, when they are no longer in the heart, they can do no harm when seen with the eyes. Well, whereas, and here's his charge against the iconoclasts, if removed, they remain, i.e. dangerously, in the heart. Images from memorial and witness to be tolerated or even encouraged, therefore, come to life under Luther's encouragement. He cites the um, example of God ordering the creation of the bronze serpent, and only when people worshipped it um, as an idolatrous image did Hezekiah come along and order its destruction. So what we find, therefore, is the commissioning of the great altarpiece at Wittenberg in the great parish church um, in the centre of town uh, from Cranach in 1546 to 47 at the time of Luther's death um, with this astonishing predella of Luther preaching. This is the Marienkirche and um, I'm very much um, moved here by the descriptions of it um, in Joseph Kerner's book um, on the subject of, ref of reformed art. And what's very interesting in this church, um, you go in, it had a great 19th century uh, refit, as you can see there, um, but the outline of the church is the same, is that when we look up to the Cranach um, altarpiece, what is happening here, and it still goes on in the con with the congregation today, is you go up and you um, take the um, bread on this side, you process around the back of the altar, and then you take the wine, um, as the figure is here, um, as you come from behind the altar. So the altar by Cranach actually realises the new sense of the Protestant um, uh, communion, one of the um, two um, sacraments, of course, that, along with baptism, that Luther um, argued to keep in place. Something about redesigning, reconfiguring the actual shape of the church around Protestant ritual is there in the very imagery which explains what is going on. Here's the famous picture of Charles V commanding his enemies in the Deutsche um, Historische Museum in Berlin. Um, on, to his right, we have there um, the, uh, Solomon the Magnificent, Pope Clement and Francis I of France, and um, on his right, three of the electors who deposed him, ending here in Philip of Hesse. Philip of Hesse is a great champion of Protestantism. He has a, an almost sole conversion in 1524 when he meets Melanchthon. In 1527, he deliberately supports suppressions of monasteries for the foundation of his new university of Marburg and four hospitals in that region too. What's very interesting is that Marburg is one of six new foundations of universities in quite a small area of Germany during the 16th century. This is one third of the total new foundations of universities in Europe, in, 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 across Europe at this time. There are only 18 of them between 1500-1620. So Marburg is very much leading the way, and it's monastic suppressions that pay for that at the hands um, of the local Landgraf, uh, Philip of Hesse. Um, 
quite close to the um, city of um, uh, Naumburg is the extraordinary site of Schulpforta. Um, Schulpforta had um, a mil miraculous image. Um, much of its history reminded me when I got reading about this of the pre-Reformation history of Boxley in Kent, the particular power of a certain image. In England it goes completely. At Schulpforta the image remains even after the Reformation. But what's also interesting here is that uh, this was a Cistercian foundation um, uh, which uh, became a school after the suppression of 1543. And still, um, when the Furstenhaus was built in 1573, it's built in exactly the same position as where conventionally at Cistercian houses the, the guest house or abbot's lodgings would have been built when they were separate structures. So a continuity of building type even in the age of secularism. Um, at Erfurt, the Dominican church, the Prederiga, um, or preaching church, was suppressed as a uh, Dominican uh, establishment as early as 1522. But what's very interesting here, and again this sensitivity to the legacy of the monasteries in the local and national um, uh, history is that the town authorities didn't destroy the um, uh, uh, documents of this establishment but they made sure they were moved to the archive of the town hall and it's in the, in the local state archives that they still survive. The monastic community remained in part of the um, Dominican buildings here, most notably in the long East Wing, uh, which um, became part school, um, part um, uh, gathering place for the remaining uh, monks of this establishment, and uh, they stayed here until 1588. And what's interesting, just looking at this um, pre-1850 print, um, is that clearly for the different functions of this surviving east wing of the cloister area, an entrance was made and a staircase built to facilitate the use of this active east wing. And there it is inside um, today, still with its original vaulting. In Halle, we have this bastion of Catholicism, a, a city which became very much given over to the new Lutheran creed. And this is because um, Cardinal Albrecht of Brandenburg, Elector of Mainz and the Archbishop of Magdeburg, um, this was his domain in the city. He reshapes the exterior of the Dominican church um, with these uh, extraordinary new um, cappings. I would have looked at the um, Durer's um, 1506 engraving of the house in the antique manner and other Italian sources for this. In an otherwise Lutheran town, he here creates um, a Catholic en um, uh, enclave. And south of the old um, uh, monastic establishment, he builds um, a, new, uh, um, a new palace. And it's here that w this still survives today. And it's now, ironically, part of the now Protestant Lutheran um, University of the town. Um, where this is the place that he builds, which is very much in the new mode of, of building. And we also have, when we look on the river side of this, uh, now a rather drab and largely 19th century restored exterior, but here we have this wonderful 18th century representation reminding us of what it once looked like um, in this uh, manuscript volume of the... Of, of the um, celebrations of the city of Halle um, from 1735. So a very grand structure which became the centre of Catholicism in this otherwise Luther, uh, Lutheran town. And finally, back to Wittenberg. The castle church, um, Frederick the Wise, a great collector of relics, persuaded by Luther to take the relics out of their containers, 
um, and store them, not destroy them, but store them, but take them off show in the early 1520s. And it's here, of course, in this part of town that Frederick the Wise founded the university in 1502 and the castle church became a place of worship and auditorium for the university. And what we equally find here is that this is a, 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 a city which honours the great man himself, uh, Frederick the Wise, in the, um, the castle chapel is memorialised by his tomb slab, uh, slab by Peter Vischer the Younger there on the left, made after his death in 1526. But also, it's clearly, he's clearly the model for this kneeling Christian knight standing nearby. And what's particularly fascinating to all of us who think about the materiality of the 16th century across Northern Europe is this is limestone, and we have the accounts from the Cranach workshop for painting it. Um, in the early 1520s. Downtown in, um, in Wittenberg, we come to the great church, which has been the centre of Lutheranism ever since the Reformation, the Marienkirche. And what's interesting here is the way in which uh, we see the coming of new churches, the dispersal of the monastic remains into new pathways through cities and towns, um, uh, through the town authorities. So it was to the south of this church that the cemetery was cleared in the 1520s and the graves moved to the outskirts of town. So what we still have surviving uh, south of the church is the uh, original cemetery chapel which um, became a warehouse. It was used rather indiscriminately over a long period of time until the mid-19th century it was restored once again as a chapel. The same thing of the dispersal of graveyards happened um, at Halle, where in the 1550s, Nikhil Hoffmann built the new Campo Santo, very grand uh, cemetery on the outskirts of town. Uh, when the um, ecclesiastical authorities uh, authorised the removal of uh, the graves from around the two big churches in the centre of town at the time when the new uh, market church was being constructed. And I end with this, moved um, by the words of um, uh, in Elizabeth de Bievre's book, recent book on um, Dutch urban art and culture, to bring this before us. Um, in all our citizen towns across Europe where the monasteries have gone, we have ways, we have roads, we have avenues named after and which recall that tremendously interesting legacy. Sometimes uh, not just ways, but also inscriptions. Here we are just down the road in the National Gallery, for want of a better description, Peter de Hoof's masterpiece, perhaps. Um, of the courtyard in Delft, where we see brick archways giving onto the inner court as these houses, these achta, behind houses, were built um, in the, um, in, in, from about 1595. The last of the monastic buildings were um, taken down in the 1590s, and um, the house of St. Jerome became a cannon foundry. And it's here in this inscription above the door that we read, This is the valley of St. Jerome. Wilt thou move towards patience and compassion? For we first have to descend before we will be uplifted. And the date, 1614. And what's interesting is that the monasteries suppressed in this part of town are called the Valley of St. Jerome, uh, St. Agnes in Josephat's Valley, and St. Mary on Mount Zion. This creation of a fictive landscape in a city that's totally flat, of going up and down, a network of religious sites and places of religious significance. And I think it's very interesting that in a fast-changing urban world, as Delft, like all Dutch towns, was in the later 16th and 17th century, there's still this significant resonance 
of uh, the power of uh, monastic um, uh, worship and intercession. Thank you. Thank you.